The terms anger and aggression are often used interchangeably by both laypeople and professionals. There are often attempts to explain a linkage between the two terms, but it has been academically difficult. One possible linkage is motive, but to understand motive we need to clearly understand emotion. Emotion is not just the way you feel. It's a complex jumble of thoughts and feelings that, and here's the important part, prepare you to take action in response to changes in the environment. Think about it. When the building you're in starts to shake along the ground, do you immediately run outside? You might think that you do, but you don't. You have a series of thoughts in less than a few seconds that may include wondering why the building is shaking. Is this an earthquake? And what should you do? Those thoughts and the mental answers you provide in less than a few seconds all give you a motive to act, and your body prepares to take action based on the combination of thoughts, feelings, and emotions that you have. You feel the emotion of fear and your body reacts by bolting out the door. Every emotion produces a motive that produces potentials for action. In the case of thinking about something that makes you angry, you have a motive to act and your body gets prepared to fight or fly, even if it never reaches the point of aggression. There are several theories to explain anger. Let's briefly examine each. Evolutionary theory proposed by Charles Darwin says that arousal of anger leads to involuntary muscle movements that can be recognized by many species. Recognizing anger through expressive movements of parts of a creature's body has survival value. It alerts friends of danger and foes of the potential for anger to turn into aggression in self-defense. The expressions may drive away intruders and this repelling action was a primary motive behind anger according to Darwin. Expressing anger repels enemies and allows creatures to go on living. It's an evolutionary requirement. Anger and aggressive motives were an instinctual reaction. William James focused on the emotional experience of anger more than the behavioral potentials. James believed that aggression was instinctual and biologically predetermined. Anger created an energy that fueled aggression on an instinctual level and then could not be bred out of creatures. Sigmund Freud honed James's theory by proposing that if the energy created by anger was not released, then it would come out as aggression. It was like a hydraulic pressure that built up and required regular draining, lest it explode under pressure. Conrad Lorenz modified James's and Freud's theories further by declaring that aggression had many useful functions in animals, both within and between species, and that the aggression motive evolved to ensure survival of the species. The frustration-aggression hypothesis was proposed by John Dollard and states that frustration is a blockage or interference with a goal and automatically produced an urge to aggress, but only when the goal was achievable. Furthermore, Dollard recognized two other things. First, that resentment could lead to the development of aggression, and second, that expectations of retaliation or punishment for aggression could produce fear that inhibited aggression. The result is a process called displacement, where aggression that cannot be directed at one target gets displaced and redirected to another, safer target. This theory fits well with social strain theory. For example, if social forces inhibit a person from reaching a goal, they may become aggressive and take what they want. A more relevant example might be the 9-11 terrorists, who were not poor and uneducated, but rather were well-educated 
with high expectations for economic and social goals that never materialized, thereby leading to frustration, anger, radicalization, and eventual aggression. Leonard Berkowitz took the frustration-aggression model in a different direction, in believing that anger was not a prerequisite for aggression. He believed that the arousal of strong negative feelings at any time could lead to aggressive impulses. Anger is just one of many negative feelings that could lead to aggression. Frustration or any sufficient negative stimulus could arouse aggression. Whatever the strong stimulus, it triggers cognitive thoughts that assess biological and learned ideas that lead to actions. Craig Anderson and Brad Bushman proposed their general aggression theory in an attempt to consolidate many of the previously proposed theories. They said that aggression occurs because of a number of personal, situational, biological, social, and psychological factors. They also threw in traits, gender, attitudes, beliefs, values, and long-term goals, all of which come to bear on situational variables like time, place, cues, provocation, drugs, and even incentives to aggress. Their theory seems to leave no stone unturned for possible reasons to aggress. They then narrowed their theory down to five basic reasons a person would aggress. 1. Anger, when aroused, lessens a person's inhibitions to aggress. 2. Anger allows a person to remain primed to aggress. 3. Anger provides an informational context that influences how stimuli will be interpreted. 4. Anger is likely to prime the pump or pull the trigger on aggressive thoughts. And 5. Anger activates a highly emotional aroused state. The general aggression theory is the combination of unique characteristics traits, and environmental factors that can lead anger to aggression. What we see from these major historical theories, however, is that the focus is primarily on aggression, with little attention on anger in and of itself. Is there a good reason to consider anger separately from aggression? Looking at it from a treatment perspective, Therapists can use any number of modalities to quickly help a person decrease aggressiveness. Their anger, however, usually remains. Defining anger and aggression separately has definite treatment value because simply treating the symptom that can be seen does not address the underlying problem that leads to the symptom. It's sort of like applying topical steroids on a rash that's caused by a virus. You can mask the symptoms, but you've ignored the disease. Taking a different tack, there are people who enjoy being aggressive toward others, but they're not significantly angry at anyone. Some people really do like getting, being, and staying angry. Treatments to address aggression have been shown to produce positive results in just a few sessions. The same cannot be said for addressing anger. Stated differently, Learning to control physical actions, or aggression, is relatively straightforward compared to learning to deal with emotional anger, which can be deep-seated and buried under feelings, resentment, pain, and many hurtful events. So just how often does anger lead to aggression? The first thing to recognize in answering this question is that not all anger leads to aggression. But in trying to answer the question, researchers have differentiated the answer by looking at men versus women, as well as between cultural groups. And in most studies, they found people rarely react with aggression when angered. Verbal anger was the most common act, at 43%, while physical aggression accounted for only 2% of responses. However, 
anger is very difficult to study. It's not something most people want to admit to, let alone have analyzed and reported on. Like many studies, college students make up a large sample of anger studies. When studies focused on persons who score high on trait anger scales, however, verbal aggression jumps to 74% and physical aggression jumps to 22%. It should be no surprise that persons predisposed toward angry feelings will react to them and become aggressive. While most research focuses on only two features, verbal and physical aggression, that leaves a large field of angry responses unaccounted for. For example, relational anger, passive anger, or indirect and covert anger are not counted. If ever considered, those anger factors might account for a significant number of episodes not previously reported. Anger, in other words, is likely significantly underreported in most studies. Those forms of anger might just be as capable of leading to aggression as any other form. If we don't study them, we don't know. We also aren't studying the differences or prevalence of people who hold anger in and hurt themselves compared to people who let anger out and hurt others. Can we predict aggressive behaviors from anger? Current research, in a word, says no. Just because there may be, or likely is, a relationship between anger and aggression does not mean it's a causal relationship. There is no clear formula to show a causal relationship between those two things. Highly angry people may express their anger in many ways short of aggression. We all have likely known people who could be described as angry or miserable, and who have no hesitation to make others angry or miserable. There's no evidence to show such people become disproportionately aggressive, and the same could be said for nearly all groups studied. Both actuarial and clinical predictions are notorious for producing false positives and false negative results, and such studies have been largely failures in their predictive capabilities. More accurate predictors of aggression are past incidents of aggression, active resentment, and a motivation for revenge. Studying aggression means studying different types of aggression. One common distinction is between hostile and instrumental aggression. Hostile aggression is often motivated to cause harm to another and characterized by impulsivity in action. Instrumental aggression may not have anger present or intent to harm another. Instrumental aggression has a motive of coercion of others to gain resources or things from others. Successful use of instrumental aggression gains the aggressor more stuff and that fuels a desire to aggress further, to get more stuff. Instrumental aggression also differs from hostile aggression in that the former often requires cognitive thought and planning to succeed. Hostile aggression may be spontaneous. These differences are supported by neuroscience that show distinct neural pathways for each type of aggression. Hostile aggression follows what is called the rage path through the brain, while instrumental aggression follows the predatory pathway. There's actually even a third distinct path that controls intermale competition for mating. When you study the actions of mass killers or terrorists, you can see that they acted more out of instrumental aggression than hostile aggression. Their actions were not impulsive. They felt slighted, rejected, bullied, denied opportunities, and perceived insults and discrimination throughout their lives, which led to built-up resentment and a desire for revenge and retaliation. They planned, sometimes for years, to act aggressively. 
revenge is one of the most dangerous factors to consider as it can lead to either hostile or instrumental aggression. Unfortunately, we do not have a model to explain how anger can lead to both deliberate and impulsive aggression. Some theorize that there may even be mixed motives for aggression that could lead to a breakdown of the current popular dichotomy of deliberate versus impulsive aggression. Mixed motives may explain aggression in highly charged incidents between persons once emotionally close but now distant, such as divorcing couples or those trapped in domestic violence. The angry person has a high tension and need to release it, but the victim's compliance and submission negates the ability to do so freely. The victim effectively denies the aggressor the reason to explode, thereby increasing the frustration and anger until it explodes in aggression. The aggressor vacillates between both deliberate and impulsive aggression. The pathways between anger and aggression are as clear as mud.